Please welcome to the stage, Chief Strategy Officer from Publicis Group, Jason Goldberg. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I was on mute. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so happy to finally be in front of a real audience. It's amazing. Uh, I hate the Zoom. Uh, and then I was super jealous because I'm sure you all saw Mayor yesterday morning and he basically, the stage yesterday as is appropriate for him was twice as tall as today. <laughs> and he like flew up. Did you see him? He has some ups. So he like, he jumped up on the stage and I'm like, I'm doing that tomorrow for sure. And then I'm talking to my wife on the phone last night and she's like, yeah, you just had your knee replaced like four weeks ago, you can't do that. So, sorry, uh, but the knee is doing great, I'm glad to say. Um, so I'm super excited uh, to talk to all of you today. Um, our topic is gonna be a detailed dive into macroeconomics. Um, so over the next four hours, we're gonna learn, oh, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Um, there, there is a little bit of uh, uh, statistics in this presentation, but hopefully um, it's towards the purpose of uh, giving us some interesting insight into what's going on in the, the world of retail and uh, affiliate marketing right now. Um, and hopefully it ends with some, some at least good guesses about where things might be going as a result of some of the crazy changes we're all seeing. So that's my shtick. Um, I'm gonna try to finish a little bit early to leave room for discussion if anyone wants to have any questions um, or refute any of the mistakes I'm inevitably gonna make. That would be awesome. And in the extraordinarily unlikely event that any of you do not get enough of me in the next 30 minutes, I have great news. There's like 300 more hours of me on the interweb. <laughs> um, so uh, I have a much smarter friend, uh, this guy Scott Wingo, and. Uh, he and I used to serve on the board of directors of the National Retail Federation, and we were, we were talking about some crazy issue a bunch of years ago, and he's like, we should make a podcast about this. And he jokes that like I showed up with $4,000 worth of recording equipment the next day, and we started this podcast. Uh, we thought our eight friends and family would listen, and it's accidentally become kind of a thing. So now we get like 50,000 people listening in every week as we ramble about shopper marketing and the evolution of, of commerce. Um, and Scott's parents spelled his name wrong, so if you need to find it in any of the, the, the uh, podcast platforms, you can just type Scott with one T, or you could just type e-commerce and our not attractive mugs will show up. Really smart idea to use our image as our logo, yeah. Um, so that's the shtick. Uh, Mayor yesterday kind of talked about all the crazy things we've lived through, and I'm like, it is a lot of crazy things. I'm gonna make a graph. Um, so I just wanna start off by kind of recapping, ground us all in how crazy the last two and a half years have been, right? If you go back in time to March of 2020, um, the World Health Organization declared a global pandemic and none of us cared. No reaction, no big deal. But a week later, the NBA canceled their season and that was a big deal. Uh, and we all did as retailers what we always do in a crisis, right? We panicked, we closed everything. Um, we canceled all our orders, we, we cut every cost, we sent all our, our, our uh, corporate headquarters employees home. Um, one of the big things we did in the first two weeks of the pandemic is we laid off 50% of all the dock workers in the United States of America, the guys that unload all the boats. We sent them all home, right? And guess what happened? Everyone stayed home and sales dipped dramatically. You can see that crazy spike. That um, was a huge economic downturn. But then, you know what happened? We sent $2 trillion to every man, woman, and child in America. And we're all locked at home. We can't go out, we can't spend any money on our vacations, we can't spend any money on travel, and we've got this new government money burning a hole in our pocket. So what did we do? We all went crazy on the Amazon, right? And sales bounced right back up, and everybody's calling it the V-shaped recovery because we went down, we went right back up. Um, and so then, guess what retailers had to do? They had to call all those factories in China, turn that stuff back on, send that stuff, send every boat you can, get the boats back on the water. And the boats started coming back on the water and more government stimulus started flooding in and sales kept going up and up and up and we were running out of stuff. And then all the boats arrived from China and guess what? There was nobody to unload the boats, right? So now we've got 160 freighters parked off the coast, like just a few uh, miles south of here in Long Beach, um, that can't unload. 
and I'm starting to start a side business of delivering In-N-Out burgers to boats, by the way. That was my big way to make money during that. Um, but so, so now we have all this sales. We have all this pent-up demand. We don't have the goods and merchandise to fulfill that demand. So supply is way up. Demand is way, uh, I'm sorry, supply is way down. Demand is way up. We all learned in economy what happens when that uh, uh, happens. Prices go up. Inflation, right? So we get hit by inflation. Throw in a war in Europe and uh, crazy disruptions in the supply chain. And that is everything we have all had to live with for the last two and a half years. Like, it's crazy. It's exhausting just to describe the graph, much less live through all that. Um, so people go, oh, man, like, how did retailers survive? Did retailers do OK? Oh, yeah. We sold $6.6 .6 trillion worth of stuff in 2021, the last full calendar year. Is that good? Yeah. It's up 18% uh, from, from the pandemic year. It's up 22% from the first year without a pandemic. And people are like, hey, Jason, is 22% growth over two years good? It's amazing. It's the best year in my entire career in retail, right? Like the gold bars are two year growths every uh, year going back 30 years in retail. And the blue bar is what we did in the pandemic. So as a whole, the retail industry sold way more stuff during the pandemic than we have ever sold in my lifetime, um, which I'm old. So that's kind of a big deal, right? And then you go, well, how's it going this year? Like what's happening this year? Um, so, so far this year, we have government data from January through July. We'll get the uh, August data comes out in about four days. So we'll come back here and redo this all. Um, the, but, but for the first half of the year, we sold $4 trillion worth of stuff. That's up about 9% from last year. That's up 32% from before the pandemic. So it's still growing. Um, but I like to paint this kind of visual picture for people to kind of make it more real. So the, the silver line there is monthly retail sales in the United States of America before the pandemic, 2019. And that is the shape of a normal year. Uh, we sell more stuff during holiday than we do any other time of the year, right? Um, and so then the pandemic happens, the gold line. Um, and you can see what happened, right? We had that big spike in uh, March when we all panicked, and then we had the recovery. And by April, we were selling more stuff in the pandemic year than we were selling the year before. So even though we had this crazy pandemic, all these supply chain disruptions, we still sold more stuff in 2020. Um, and we were all really curious to see what was going to happen in 2021, right? Super uncertain year. Um, uh, like all the holiday forecasts were like, no idea. Don't know if customers are going to go to the store. Don't know if they're going to celebrate uh, Christmas and buy presents for their family. Don't know if they're going to be able to find the presents if they do want to buy them. Um, so what happened? Boom, shakalaka, right? <laughs> 2021 was a crazy, amazing year, way over what we normally have. Um, and this December, all my friends are saying like, hey, Jason, what is 2022 going to look like? And I was telling them, it doesn't matter because you should retire right now. <laughs> like in retail, your main KPI, the main goal you get paid on is comps, comparable store sales. How much did you sell this year versus last year? And guess what you don't want to do the year after the greatest year in the history of retail? Work in retail. <laughs> because this year, we all have to comp against this crazy number, right? I'm, I'm only half joking. And, and you know there are all these factors that drove things. Uh, I'm sad to report the pandemic's not over, but mentally it's over for a lot of uh, worldwide consumers. And we're seeing a lot of behaviors, at least partly regressed to pre-pandemic. And you go, man, people can travel again. We can go to Santa Barbara and see our friends for the first time. Um, we can rage all night at the after party. We're going to spend our money on hangover remedies instead of all that other retail stuff that we used to spend it on. And sales are probably going to go down. So let's see what's happening so far this year. And so far this year, we are outperforming the crazy 2021 year. And so that's, that's great news. All my friends that didn't retire last year, smart uh, decision, you're still doing okay. Um, but the wrinkle, hey Jason, how much of that growth is inflation versus people just wanting more stuff, right? And that's a great question. Um, before I get to it, I just want to highlight that so far today we've been talking about averages, and averages are a little dangerous because no one lives in averages. We all have specifics, right? So as a mentor once told me, on average, the country of Nepal is flat. They have just as many ups as they have downs. And if you looked at the averages, you'd miss the giant mountain in the middle called Everest. Um, 
So when we break down that retail growth this year, you can see there's queer winners and losers. Like who's by far the biggest winner? The gas stations, right? Because like people are driving, going back to work a little bit, not as much as before, but somewhat, um, and they're paying a lot more for that gas. So gas is, after having a really cruddy year during the pandemic, it's having an amazing year. Um, similarly, restaurants are having a moment where uh, uh, it's super interesting uh, to see how, how many more calories consumers are getting from restaurants than they are grocery stores right now, which is a whole fascinating conversation for a, a talk like next week at Grocery Shop, which is the digital grocery shelf. Um, on average, I said we've grown 8.9%. All the categories that did really well during the pandemic are not doing awesome this year, right? So um, if you were like in the home furnishings and furniture, uh, if, if you were in the, the uh, automobile industry, like um, we've, you, you had this big year and now you're not comping as well against that big year, but you're still up. And then the one crazy outlier in this whole thing, which is somewhat counterintuitive, but on whole, one category that has done very poorly during the entire pandemic is the poor consumer electronics industry, which is actually down year to date. A variety of reasons for that, but one of the big reasons is it's the one category in the world that does not have inflation. It actually has deflation. Like that cool TV you want is cheaper this year than it was last year. Um, so that's part of it. But let's talk more about inflation. Uh, at the end of last year, uh, the CPI, which is one way of measuring inflation, they're all bad ways. We can do a deep dive in that in a Q&A later if you want. Um, but CPI was 8.5%. Uh, if any of you turned on the TV in your room yesterday, CPI for this month just came out, it's at 8.3%. So down slightly from that, but up slightly from last month, which was a huge Debbie Downer for all of the, the uh, stock market guys that then uh, had a huge sell-off and we had a big big drop in, the, uh, in all the major stock markets in the US because we were hoping inflation was going down and it, it climbed up a little bit. Now, the truth there is actually a little more complicated. Inflation is this really complicated mix of products and services. Um, the, the part of products that went uh, way down is uh, gas and energy, like continues to go down, food is going way up, and then the services are continuing to go up. So it's Again, averages are a little dangerous, but we could talk about that more later. Uh, so I took all that inflation data for this year and I applied it to the retail sales data. And the blue line is actual retail sales. And the gold line is what retail sales would have been without inflation. And so this is super interesting. If you look at 2019 and most of 2020, the sales were the same, right? The blue line is basically on top of the gold line. Inflation was almost uh, a non-factor. And side note, we almost always have inflation. We rarely have deflation. So like the Fed tries to have about two and a half to three percent inflation. So some, some is, not, is kind of cooked into the system. But then about halfway through last year, we kind of opened up this gap between the gold line and the blue line. And then starting this March, the gap doubled, right? Um, and so if we look at last year's sales and said how much of that monster year was inflation, the answer is about 5% of it was inflation, was unexpected inflation. Um, so again, we had that 22% growth, only 5% was inflation. But if we look at how much of the 8.9% growth we've had this year's inflation, do you know how much it is? It's all of it. Like retail sales would be flat were it not for inflation. And so again, those friends of mine that took the advice to retire may end up being smarter than the ones that are comping on inflation because that's a hard thing to sustain, right? So if people have questions later, we could talk more about the whole inflation thing. But to me, the th most important trend that happened in the pandemic is the impact of the pandemic and the war and the supply chain and inflation on e-commerce and how we all discover new products to buy and make purchase decisions. So let's look at that for just a second. Um, so far year to date, we've sold $483 billion online. That's just under 15% of all retail. It's up 7% from last year. It's up almost 90% from before the pandemic, right? So e-commerce continues to go crazy. That's not super controversial. People aren't surprised. If you want to see the graph again, it looks like that. So again, it went up every year, including in the, the pandemic. When everyone panicked and didn't go to the store, they bought more stuff online. So it's kind of the gold line is the inverse of the, the retail line, but otherwise it's basically the same. 
Um, but what people like to talk about is how fast e-commerce grows versus how much retail grows. And this is the long 30-year view, and you can basically see you know, e-commerce is smaller, but it grows much faster. So a typical year in e-commerce, we grow 15 to 20% a year. A typical year in retail, we grow 4 4.5% a year. So the gold line is retail, the blue line is e-commerce. But then if you zoom into the last three years, something interesting, right? The pandemic happens, e-commerce goes way up, retail goes slightly down. Uh, but then as people get tired of all this stuff, look what happened. For the first time in my career, again, retail actually grew faster than e-commerce for a few quarters. So do you know what everyone in the media does when that happens? They write all these stories about how the e-commerce fad is finally over, right? <laughs> they, uh, and like, man, uh, all the, uh, you remember those guys at Shopify? That was a sucker's bet, right? Like, <laughs> nobody, nobody needs e-commerce. Um, and they show this graph. And this graph I actually took from the Wall Street Journal. They're like, the blue line is what percentage of all retail sales is e-commerce. Um, and so you can see it's kind of an increasing percentage from 2 or 3% back in the 2000s to 14% right uh, before the pandemic. And then you see like it did all this crazy stuff, but look where it ended up, right where you'd expect it, right? And so everyone's like, look, people shop more online because of the pandemic, but now that it's over, they're back to normal. That was a, a, a one-time spike and you shouldn't get so excited about it, right? Um, and literally, Shopify laid off a bunch of their employees and put this graph in their, their investor report and said, yeah, we kind of overestimated how fast e-commerce would grow. And here's the thing. These people are all wrong. They're all looking at the percentage of e-commerce to the uh, retail sales, numerator, denominator, for those of you that were more smarter than me in college. Um, the, they don't actually teach division in college, I don't think, but you get the idea. Um, so remember all the, those uh, data points I just showed you about how crazy retail went? The denominator went crazy, right? So talking about a ratio doesn't make much sense. You want to see what actually happened to e-commerce over the last three years? Yeah, that's dollars, right? We grew by 90%. Like e-commerce was a big deal, it was growing way faster than retail, it's, it's becoming a bigger deal. And the reason that that's important is because all of us primarily play um, in this, this, this space that I'll call digitally influenced sales, right? Which is directly tied to how much people are willing to buy and discover products online. So let's talk about that for a second. Um, I hate it when people talk about that 14%, right? If you look on the left, uh, before the pandemic, 13%, right? The, the white gray uh, thing. 13% of all sales were online. But another 36% of all sales were digitally influenced. What does that mean? Oh, I use Google Maps to find a store near me. Um, I read ratings and reviews on Amazon. I, I read about the product attributes from the manufacturer's website. I saw an influencer on social media talk about it. If I take all that digitally influenced sales and I add it to the e-commerce sales, before the pandemic, 49%, half of that $6.5 trillion in sales were digitally influenced. Do you know what that means? Everyone in this room is wildly underpaid, <laughs> right? So just clip that one clip out of my talk, show it to your boss, you're welcome. Um, so now let's think about what happened during the pandemic. At the peak of the pandemic, e-commerce was 17% of sales, but digitally influenced sales was 45%. So during the pandemic, 62% of all sales were digital, right? And where is it going? Like we may never have more than 25% of all sales happening online, but it doesn't matter because virtually all sales are going to be digitally influenced, right? Uh, I have this really scary job. Uh, I, I help uh, Doug McMillan, the CEO of Walmart, write his investor presentation. So I'm like the PowerPoint jockey. Um, and he used to, in every one of those presentations, he used to talk about um, our 4,000 stores. Like, this is what American consumers did in our 4,000 stores. If you watch his investor presentations this year, he doesn't say that. You know what he says? Our 50 million stores. Do you know why? Because the front door flagship experience for Walmart is the Walmart mobile app that's on 50 million consumers' phones, right? And that is now the front door of the store. And so this thinking about digitally influenced sales versus e-commerce sales is what we all ought to be doing. And it's a transition that, that every brand and retailer in America is going through in a different phase. 
Um, and that purchase cycle has been wildly disrupted, right? Uh, it was already being disrupted before the pandemic. The pandemic accelerated that disruption. And one of the big ways it disrupted it is it broke this thing that we call the first moment of truth. First moment of truth was a phrase that was coined by Procter & Gamble. And what Procter & Gamble said is, the way people discover new products, the number one lead source in the United States of America for CPG products is this thing called S. I S saw in store, right? That's how you discovered new products. And the first moment of truth is when you discovered that new product on the aisle in a Target store and decided whether you were gonna buy it um, or not, right? And guess where people do not discover new products anymore? <laughs> in the aisle on Target, right? So the first moment of truth is broken. Think about the first moment of truth. I'm famously addicted to coffee. I have a weird allegiance to Starbucks. So if I'm gonna get some Starbucks at my local grocery store, I have to walk by 350 other coffee SKUs to get to my beloved Starbucks section, right? So that first moment of truth opportunity happened for those 350 SKUs that I walked by. But think about what happens in digitally influenced sales. I just type Starbucks into Target, and it goes right to Starbucks. How many other SKUs did I see in that path to purchase, right? I had no opportunity for serendipitous discovery. I had no opportunity for a first moment of truth. So where is that discovery happening, right? We talk a lot about e-commerce solved buying, but it broke shopping, right? Like we're not finding new stuff. Oh, I'll tell you where the new discovery is happening. <laughs> it's happening on TikTok, right? Uh, this is a, a video uh, that went viral during the pandemic uh, for whipped coffee. Has anyone tried whipped coffee? It's actually, it's, yeah, very delicious. Highly recommend. Um, so I mentioned I do a lot of work for Walmart. I get this report every week of the top sellers and top categories at Walmart. Um, and during the pandemic, I get this report and they're like, this category is in the top 10 that's never been in the top 10 before, instant coffee. What the heck is going on? Like, we can't get enough instant coffee. We're all sold out of instant coffee. Um, what did we do? Like, right? Uh, oh, I'll tell you what, right? We didn't do anything. TikTok did it, right? And look at the Google trends. Uh, the, the whipped coffee trend uh, had a huge spike, but instant coffee, an ingredient of uh, whipped coffee, um, also had a huge spike, right? So the discovery, that first moment of truth, from the Target shelf is now the zero moment of truth on Instagram, right? Um, and that, to me, is a fundamental change that we are best positioned in the world to take advantage of. So I'm really excited by this. Side note, before I get off whipped coffee, um, the absolute best way to make whipped coffee is to merge my two trends. It's to get the Starbucks Via which is these little cubes of, because in, most instant coffee is actually dehydrated coffee, and it's nasty. Uh, the Starbucks Via is freeze-dried real coffee, and so it works, it works perfect, but anyway. Um, <laughs> my point is that the, mo the, the point of inspiration has been exploded. It's not in the store anymore. It's happening at an unlimited number of micro moments that are ever expanding across the universe, right? And so how do we get to all those micro moments? How do we get to all of those places and help consumers make purchases? How do we escalate visibility um, for the, the micro moments that are most important to us? Like obviously, the biggest answer worldwide is social. And uh, this is a public service slide that I always do. Uh, it drives me nuts when I'm talking to clients because they always talk about social and then at some point during social, they'll, sh they'll, be, they'll shift to talking about live streaming and they'll use them synonymously. Um, and uh, there are all these different things going on. Like, I like to talk about the hierarchy of social, right? Like, the biggest bucket is social discovery. It's people consuming content across any social experience that makes them aware or have more desire to buy something, right? And so the transaction probably happens in a Kroger store, not on the web, but social discovery is this biggest bucket, right? And then right below that is social commerce, where we directly um, drive a transaction. Uh, maybe it's a native transaction on the platform, maybe it's a, a handoff with an affiliate link to a retailer site, um, but, but a transaction happens uh, in close proximity or, or even last quick attribution to this, this consumption of social content. And then we have the subset of that where the social content is video-based, right? And the overwhelming majority of video content is not live. <laughs> like, which, again, a bunch of my clients are like, 
yeah, but live streaming is the cool hip one. That's what I want to do. Um, so then below video commerce, there's one-to-many live streaming. There's actual live streaming, which we're going to talk about is a little different in China than it is here. It's still very small here. And if you follow the news, a bunch of the big social platforms have kind of pulled back from their their live streaming commerce initiatives. Uh, TikTok, uh, Adalyun has it in a bunch of geographies. They've said, we're gonna delay bringing it to the US. Uh, Facebook had a pilot. They said, uh, gosh, we're turning off the pilot. Um, our friends at Amazon do it. Um, and it, at the moment, it seems like uh, they can only get influencers when they pay them a stipend. And as soon as the stipend expires, nobody seems to be making enough money to stay on the platform, right? So super interesting stuff. And then there's, a part of live streaming that people don't talk about very much that turns out to be super valuable, one-to-one -one live streaming. That's the Neiman Marcus fashion consultant talking to you in your closet about what's gonna look awesome in Santa Barbara at that new conference at the beach party, right? Um, and, and so increasingly, it's taking that expertise from the retail store and uh, FaceTiming it to customers in their home. Will this washing machine fit in my, my laundry room? Um, will this jacket look good with with my wardrobe, all those sorts of things. So that's the hierarchy of social commerce. For my retail clients, they have a huge dilemma. Should we be buying or renting customers? Jason, what do you mean by buying or renting customers? Oh, well, uh, when we find a customer on TikTok, we're renting that customer, right? Like we, we pay a marketing fee for access to that customer. TikTok doesn't want to give us that customer. They ideally would like to sell something to that customer um, and charge us for that, but they don't really make it easy. And in many cases, the social platforms make it difficult for Walmart to form a direct relationship with that customer to get the first party data. They want to be the seller of record in many cases. Uh, and I'm just using TikTok, but this, think of this as all the social platforms. Um, in China, uh, the lion's share of social commerce happens on a platform called Taobao Live. Taobao is owned by Alibaba, the largest e-commerce site in the world. So it's kind of like all the e-commerce, all the, the video consumption is not happening on Daoyun in China, which is TikTok here. It's happening on Alibaba Live. It's happening on JD Live. It's happening on platforms that retailers own. So a super interesting difference. In the US, all the minutes of, of content are being consumed on platforms that retailers don't own where they have to rent customers. In China, the bulk of, of content consumption is happening on platforms that retailers do own. Um, and so if you're a retailer in America, you go, I wanna make us more like China, <laughs> right? And so you've seen a bunch of retailers try to launch their own content consumption platforms. I don't think that's gonna work, the jury's out. Um, uh, I think there's a lot of differences between the two markets. Um, but if we look at sales to date, at the moment, eMarketer says that about 15% of all e-commerce in China is social commerce. Um, and that's a big deal, because e-commerce in China is way bigger than in the US. In China, e-commerce is about just under 50% of all retail sales, and here it's 15%. So it's 15% of a much bigger number. It's social commerce is about 5% of all sales in the US. So everyone that I have ever talked to that tries to sell a brand or retailer in social commerce, they always sh like look at this graph and go, is China ahead of the US and we're just gonna catch up? Are China and the US different? I always like to point out that chopsticks have been around for a long time, but Americans still haven't embraced chopsticks. It's not just a linear progression, sometimes cultures uh, have distinct differences. Um, so this whole East versus West consumer thing is very interesting, but I have a hypothesis for why uh, the social commerce is so different in China than it is in the US. It's because it's way easier to buy stuff on social commerce in China. 90% um, of Chinese consumers own a digital wallet. Half of all transactions in China, at in-store, out-of-store, uh, online, on uh, WeChat, on Weibo, all the, the platforms, all the purchases are a digital wallet. You know what we don't use very much in the US? Digital wallets. So I like to say it takes three hands to buy something in the US, right? One hand to hold the phone, one hand to tap the screen, and a third hand to hold your credit card while you're typing the credit card number in. And there just turns out to not be a huge market for three-handed consumers to do social commerce. Um, so my, my premise is that as it gets easier to pay for things in the US, as so digital wallets become more prevalent and more ubiquitous in the US, we will start to look more like the behavior patterns that we see in China. And guess what the pandemic did? Taught everyone how to use a digital wallet, right? 
Raise your hand if your parents knew how to use a QR code before 2019. Yeah, nobody did, right? Raise your hand if your parents can order a meal at a restaurant with a QR code now. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, the pandemic changing uh, behavior. And so the, my takeaway from this 30 minutes, if you take nothing else, I think this trend towards discovery happening on retailers' shelves, digital or physical, and moving uh, to off-site opportunities um, that are largely driven by micro-influencers, this is the biggest shift that's happening as a result of digital disruption in commerce. And guess what it is? It's, it's an evolution of the affiliate marketing that we've all been doing, right? Like, I, I can't tell you how many stakeholders I talk to at huge retail brands that are like, like, yeah, if only we could have a link in that social commerce and keep track of like which content creators drove which, I'm like, yeah, do you know we've been doing that for 20 years, right? Um, and, and it's crazy. Like, th there is a huge opportunity here. Um, so I wanna leave us with one more example and then I'll open it up for Q&A. I mentioned that this is a little more prominent in China than it is in US. Um, so uh, 2020 Singles Day uh, in China, the founder of Alibaba, Jack Ma, um, is having a live streaming contest against one of the most successful live streamers in China, uh, this guy Austin Lee. And Austin Lee is known as the Lipstick King, for those of you that don't know. Um, he, he, uh, he's famous for, and that's Jack Ma. Uh, so they are both having a live contest on, on uh, Alibaba for Singles Day or Double Eleven Day, and they're, they're seeing who can sell the most lipstick. Uh, spoiler alert, Austin sold uh, 15 million SKUs. Uh, Jack Ma did not, so Austin won. Um, a year later, this is my favorite part, Austin puts on the lipstick, and Jack Ma looks at him and goes, yeah, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> um, the, a year later, Austin uh, sold $1.7 billion worth of a GMV on Singles Day in 2021, right? Like, it's crazy. Um, how much? consumers trust the influencers that they have grown to love. Like there's gonna be a, a session later today next door on TikTok. I think it's uh, Christina Tobacco and she talks about this super fascinating concept to me of parasocial and how all these, these 60 million followers of Austin have a, a one-way relationship with Austin and feel like he's a friend and feel like they're cheating on him if they buy lipstick from, from someone else. Um, and so that, is my sort of POV on how uh, the pandemic and inflation are driving more of the commerce opportunity worldwide right into our arms. And so hopefully you've already gotten some hints yesterday, you're gonna get a lot more this afternoon about how we can all take advantage of this trend. Um, but I hope I've helped make you think about it a little differently and I'd love to discuss it further if anyone has any comments or questions. Uh, and we do, I think we have a mic runner. There's a question in the front row. Oh. All right, yes, we do have time for Q&A. We actually have two ways that we can manage this. So, oh. Gosh, I've Speaking got, cube? Yep, speaking cube. Oh, fine. Uh. <laughs> so we just toss it after you're done with your question to the next I person. Talk, whoa, Ooh. that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, my question was about the chart that you shared after the Wall Street Journal, one that you screened that you shared yeah. um, with the projection versus actual of e-commerce revenue. How do you take into account increasing costs? How do you look at margin, growth of margin? Yeah, so uh, I mean, the, 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 the trite answer is uh, uh, we don't. Because um, <laughs> that's, that's... Yeah, it is, it, is, it is the right question to be asking in your business. Um, public data sources are limited, right? And. Uh, I spend way more time than anyone else I know with this US Department of Commerce data set and we could get into all the new, like, it is the best public data set that's available in the United States of America to suss out these trends. It's wildly imperfect, right? And, and one of the ways it's imperfect is it measures the wrong thing. Like, we don't actually care about revenue, we care about profit. Like, one of the big trends of inflation, I mentioned inflation is good for revenue, right? Like goods are more expensive, mm -hmm. people still buy goods, so we had 9% more sales. Why is that not a good thing, Jason? Oh, well, uh, before the pandemic, those sales were of a new dress to go out for the first time. After the pandemic, those sales are of chicken, right? It's essentials instead of non-essentials. 
at uh, most retailers, those essential sales are way lower margin yeah. than non-essential. So if you watch the earnings report at Walmart and Target and every other big retailer in America, they said, hey, good news, top line GMV is up. Bad news, profitability is down. Inflation is shifting our mix. Consumers are getting more uh, cautious. Not even just consumers that have to, by the way. Uh, more millionaires are now shopping at Dollar General and Walmart. Like Part of Walmart saying, hey, we didn't take such a big hit, it's because we got more rich people coming to Walmart buying more stuff. Um, and so, yeah, there's not a great public data set on the profitability. We can look at an individual category and kind of infer yeah, it. Yeah, because obviously with inflation, costs for businesses are going up. Exactly. So if, it, if that's parallel with the revenue growth, then it's flat. Yeah. Exactly. And if you think about it, inflation is actually a double whammy. Yeah. We're, we're selling stuff that's less profitable, but also our costs, everything we spend money on, inflation went up on, right? And I didn't, I didn't go into all this detail on that chart, but if you remember my very first slide of all the bad things that happened, um, well, before the pandemic, we paid $5,000 to get a boat, a container on a boat in China and get it here. Um, for Christmas of last year, uh, of 2021, uh, we were paying $25,000 to get that container here, right? So even if we got the same sale, like our margins were heavily eroded. And one of the problems we have at the moment is we're, we're chasing a moving target. What are consumers going to want to buy this Christmas? I have no earthly idea, right? But we have to have put a supply chain in place for that stuff. And yeah. to get it here fast, we're paying more for that supply chain. And so the, the fuel costs that go up, fuel costs are a huge part of a retailer's business. We, we use fuel to get the boat here from China. We use fuel to get the stuff off the boat to get it to the stores. It's a mess. Yeah. So, All right. Are there question. other questions? Uh, I saw a few other hands raised. Who, if you want to pass that cube or toss it. it... Oh, geez. OK. <laughs> Who else has a question? Yeah, you must have been a college basketball player to get this job at CJ. <laughs> Do you want to catch it? I hope we have a high frame rate. I want the action shots. <laughs> Seriously. Of all. Um, I have a question in regards to social influence and your thoughts, if you have any, on how augmented reality and virtual reality will play into that. Yeah. Uh, so I, uh, I, I talk to audiences about these trends a lot. And the trend I get asked to talk about the most at the moment is the metaverse. Yep. And the trend I like talking about the least is the metaverse. <laughs> uh, I'm in a, if any of you follow me on Twitter right now, you'll see like I'm, a, I'm in a Twitter feud on link, uh, that went over to LinkedIn and there are all these trolls because uh, uh, Starbucks just launched, again, my favorite brand, just launched a new NFT based affinity program, right? Um, and so now for all the coffee I buy, I'm going to get Starbucks NFTs. And I, I made a comment like, Oh man, that's really interesting. I know Starbucks has a goal to be carbon neutral coffee company. Uh, that's pretty tricky when every NFT you give me costs like 3,000 kilograms of carbon uh, 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 CO2 emissions. Um, and, uh, and a bunch of like climate deniers jumped into my LinkedIn. <laughs> and they're like, CO2 is good for the earth. You die without CO2. I'm like, yeah, a little, <laughs> but not, not that much. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, the specifically AR and VR, I have a slightly more nuanced perspective. Uh, AR to me is super interesting to shopping. We talked about digitally influenced yeah. sales. Um, so a bunch of sales still happen in that store. If you during the pandemic learned how to shop online, you learned about this new thing that they don't have in stores called um, ratings and reviews. Guess what the most important attribute is to driving sales online? Ratings and reviews. Social proof. Like all of this social content that says someone made this decision before me and had a good outcome is the most influential trust endowing thing we can do in e-commerce. Guess what the social proof is in a brick and mortar store? There isn't any, right? Like I, I always joke, I used to work at Best Buy and at Best Buy I said it was the police tape around the last TV on Black Friday when two people like got out mace and were fighting over the last TV. Um, true story, sadly. Uh, so uh, guess what's happening right now? Every retailer is trying to figure out how to put social proof in the store. So you see all the new stores are opening with uh, digital fact tags with ratings and reviews on them. But the best way to do it is to use your mobile phone. And what's the best way to trigger the ratings and reviews on the mobile phone when you're standing in the aisle? It's AR, right? It's aim that camera at the aisle and overlay all of the, the digital attributes and social proof on it. So I'm, I'm very bullish on AR. 
uh, more skeptical on VR uh, for a variety of reasons. There's going to be a, sub, uh, a segment of people that use VR for gaming at home and love it. And for sure, we should be marketing to those people in their native platforms. But I'm kind of uh, skeptical uh, that someone that goes to the Apple store to buy an Apple Watch because they think girls will like them better if they have an Apple Watch are going to put the VR headset on to try on the, the Apple Watch because it doesn't look attractive. All right, Jason, thank you. Let's give, our, let's give Jason a big applause for a wonderful session today. Thank you.